Let's uh, just start up again. So, what are you guys discussing? So, one of the things we said was like, yeah, is you, you, you had this sort of urgency importance. Yes. And actually, we think they can be the same thing at the same time. So, an example is somebody having an apart, a heart attack. It's urgent that they get treatment, and it's important to them that they get treatment. So, how can you have it in two ends of an axis when actually it is the same thing at the same time? Um, no, so, so I'm using the definition from Eisenhower, and so trying to separate out urgent with like needs to be done right now as opposed to important that can be deferred. And the important things again were the bigger things that you could delay. And so um, I'm not going to argue with argument. So I so <laughs> I'm not going to argue with Eisenhower. Uh, if, you, if you actually look on some of the references about about it, there's a lot of people that they're going to report the same thing, but that's not the context in which you're in. Okay, but in this context, and then this comes down to that context, mm. the whole word we've been using. Context is the whole thing, it's the big thing, and that's for us what you've been discussing, so I mean, we find the context is the, is the overriding theme for, for us, it's context. So, so we'll look this back again on, on context. So, so it's texture, the texture is made of a weave of threads and tie. Right, not the screen, and the and the con is because you pick one system of interest that goes over a period of time, and so the the, the context here would be everything except that one thread that weaves in that. So the idea of a hole is is that you actually have multiple holes. Each one of the threads is a hole. Okay. The, the problem with, with is then when you, you switched over for the contextual view uh, from the orga organicist view because the organicist view would have a whole and then the environment, right? When you go over to the contextualist view, you're either in the texture or you're not in the texture. So there's no boundary. There's no discussion of an environment that way. Okay, it's an interesting concept. I we're sort of including in our work, thinking about context, environment would be an element of the context in the, in, in the way that we've been looking at it. Well, it would, it, what you would call environment would be another thread, yeah. but that's that's now a whole. Because, so the, the, the key word I got from Tim Ingle is alongside. And so he talks about being in a river and you know having boats floating down the river together, right? Uh, and so each one of the boats is a whole, but if, if you actually now take the trace in time, you have the threat, right? Uh, discussing the environment, you could say almost well, everything outside of that boat, but it doesn't really help when you're trying to navigate with the other ones. So it's a shift in, in the way that you express it. But then if you have to use the continuity analogy, you are a boat by river, the environment then becomes a huge thing because if you've got, say, a huge waterfall or a torrent of rain, this is then pushing it accelerates the river, that's going to have a direct impact on all the little subsystems, as I would call it, of the individual boats. Yeah, but, you, but you can tech it. See, if you go full contextless, there is no subsystem. But then how do you explain, so you've got an environment that's having a direct impact on all of the whole, which are all the whole. No, they, it would be, it would be part of, it would be a thread in the texture. So you're talking about the weather, the weather could be a thread. Okay, but the thread, the weather will have a direct impact and a direct interaction, so the, the threads therefore have to combine at some point for them to have an interaction. And then they disconnect. So if you have a storm coming through, then the storm is connected and it causes an issue, and then the storm is not, a, and then the storm stops, it's no longer part of the threat. No, but the environment has changed as a result of the storm on a continual basis because that's the nature of. No, see, so, so this, this is why we're into meta philosophy because it's a different way of thinking. There is no environment in contextualism. Okay. See, that, that's, that's the part, you're, you're talking about the part where Mike Jackson says that Marilyn Emery is, is wrong. That's exactly the issue because she talks about system and environment, and in contextualism, there is no environment. There's only other threads because the, the idea would be that you're either connected to a thread or you're not connected to a thread. You're part of the texture, or you're not part of the texture. But the and if you want to call the texture an environment, well, it's like well, that's not really the way they work because they're on time and they disconnect. Because if you had a system and you had an environment and you take time, when is the environment not part of the system? Not not part of the environment. 
that depends on your boundaries because, and it also, and it also depends on your perception of what the boundaries are. No, but, it, but, but what happens is that's exactly the issue, is that if you look at the definition of, of organicism, it is development in time. And so you're working from, uh, work, you're working from the uh, caterpillar to the butterfly, right? Okay. And so, so, so you're working from a part into a whole, and, and progression is only one direction in time. And when, but when you get the ideas of things that come together and then go apart and they weave in and out, then talking about environment doesn't, that's not part of the vocabulary. But I suppose that then you look at the caterpillar and then just maybe using the environment, which is more helpful. If there is then a big rainstorm, then it's going to kill the caterpillar and then it's that threat. So therefore, there has been a direct impact as a result of another threat. But you can look at the weather as a thread, and then it's not part of the environment. Okay. So, so it's, a, it's a different expression. So it, that, that's why it's meta philosophy. So I'm not saying that one is right or wrong. It's that if you stay within the frame, it's like the machine that the, 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 the mechanicist, but, right? So certain mm -hmm. things make a sense. And, and so, so Kairos felt time doesn't make sense when you're talking about a machine. It doesn't feel time, right? So uh, the idea of duration makes sense in contextualism, but it doesn't make sense in organicism because development that happens continuously. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's tricky. A lot of it has to do with the, the, the views on time. But yeah, it's, it, it, uh, you can look at the pepper, it's, it's sticky. <laughs> it's really sticky. I hope this isn't a silly question. Sure. Could it be viewed as a spectrum rather than either or, or is the Contradiction and assumption so large that it couldn't be a spectrum. Uh, so, are you talking between organicism and, uh, and contextualism, or are you talking between the other? Between organicism and contextualism. No, they're separate. They're separate worldviews. Because the, the, the question, and let me bring that back. Uh, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Uh, so, so the, the issue isn't just these descriptions, it's actually about the synthetic, dispersive, and the integrative here, right? So, so what happens in, in this case, they're both synthetic, but this is integrative in that you've got the idea of constructive development. So when you're creating the butterfly, it's, it is on this directional arrow and you are creating that butterfly. But when you're talking about a storm coming through, a storm is a qualitative duration. It doesn't like storm into a stormery storm or stormer and then it's a maximum storm. It's a, it's a, it's a duration of a period of time. Okay. Okay. Yeah, these, these are really tricky. Yeah, actually, what I did was I um, I created a uh, a wiki. Uh, I wonder if I can bring that up. Did this as federated wiki. Oh, my screen has gone off. Can't see that here. Um, hmm. I created a federated wiki, and and if you actually search on Pepper, you'll probably end up and find it. Um, uh, so I dissected the book into multiple sections on a, on a wiki, um, on the federated wiki. And so it, uh, there's a place where it goes through like chapter, verse, the whole thing. And, uh, they, they, and, and so this misunderstanding about contextualism is at the core of it. But thinking about things as threads and taking out and saying, well, you can't talk about environment. And there's also no discussing parts. There's only holes. Because what does it mean to be part of a threat? Well, okay, if you take it in the contextual, uh, in the contextual dualistic view, then it's like you always have the, um, uh, there's always two going down. So the extension, and the, the, the best expression of, um, of, the, of the stuff that I'm doing as opposed to uh, Pepper is, let's see, jump down. So the dancing with other dancers 
is the is is kind of the test of contextualism, dyadicism, if you if you really get it. Um, and, and this has been the challenge, even within our team, change of learning about, you know, can we find a better metaphor to explain it? And so, talking about holes here, well, you could, if, if they're all holes, each dancer is a hole, and they have to be in pairs, then, you know, how do you, how do you deal with this? So, if you're, if you're talking about the storm before, like, I could see it if you're talking in terms of, of, um, Day and night, or talking about um, shade, and you know, you have, you have to take both the dyadic into account. You have to always think in terms of twos, and that's really hard to do. Okay, I mean, I, I'm not sure I necessarily agree because I'm not sure I necessarily agree that it works. So, for me, looking at that, I would say there are possibilities of setting boundaries around each answer. It's, there's a lot of boundary stuff going on that I think is. is if if is you approach it from Rob Gannis's point of view. Yeah. I think from. Okay. But even a thread, you've got a boundary because what makes up the thread has got to have a boundary to define a thread, surely. Uh, but, the, but the boundary is in time, it's not in space. Okay. They might have to just let us. Yeah, no, that, that's what happens when you start working on it. See, see, so, so this, this is the trick. So the, 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 the net of all of this is think when and where, not what and why. And, and, the, and so the contextual, contextual is about when and where. Now, you have to think about what, what, when is it not when and where? And so if something exists like forever, if something is permanent, it's not when and where. So something is universal. You're saying that gravity is universal? There's no when and where about gravity. Like it's 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 a law that they put in. That's a what and a why. That's not about a when and a where. There's nothing about that. So it comes from a different philosophy, a different approach to it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's kind of in the same the same category. You know, science. It's kind of like you can discuss terms. You can discuss in terms of physics, in terms of biology, in terms of chemistry. You know, all these different branches of science, you can discuss them in different ways. It doesn't mean that any one of them is wrong, but within a frame, it's kind of like, oh, we're going to discuss an automobile in terms of chemistry. You say, it's an electric automobile. And you go, okay, we can discuss electric automobile in terms of chemistry because there's at least a battery, but, you know, it might be better to discuss it in terms of physics. Depending on what the context is and what your setting has the reason for this good. So we actually mentioned automobiles, and for instance, how different philosophies could be different things. And it's yeah. like you could apply lots of different systems to looking at cars and philosophies. And actually, you would like to think that ultimately, if they're all useful, I'm trying to use the best words, and it's not a great pay for me to find words, then they will all come out with something before we almost to get you from A to B. However, if you went down one approach, you would get an electric car, and you know, let's remember the electric car was invented before the petroleum car. Another approach led you with the petroleum car, and yet a third approach might actually give you something that went straight to the hydrogen car. And actually, you get a car at the end of it, but actually, what you get within the system in the first place can be very different, and it's about what is it you're looking for at the end, which is something to get you from A to B with four wheels. And actually, depending on which approach you take, might actually give you a different way of ending up with that end, end point. Okay. Now, if you do it from a, a time perspective, so th this is where wayfaring comes in. The experience of being in the vehicle as opposed to the vehicle itself. But we, I, it, if you're looking at how the vehicle evolved to become into existence, so from a time point of view, that's the point. It's if you've got different philosophies, you know, today we've been talking about Chinese philosophy, Western philosophy. So you would like to come up with the, they come up with a similar answer because they're equally and they have value. But actually they might come up with it through a different mechanism and approach. Um, I don't think that they're equal actually. And I don't, it, I, I think that they, these are, so, the world hypotheses that Pepper has put up, like the reason they call the world hypotheses is that it's pragmatist. It, and everyone else would call it a world theory. 
So essentially the question is, how does the world work? And how do you explain the web of the world? So he has four world theories. Um, but he works in a philosophy of doubt, and so he says a hypothesis. So explaining the, the whole world, like you can explain it like a machine, and a lot of people do that. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I got a call um, with the EQ Labs, and they're saying that when they do the survey in organizations, it's like 90% of the people will express their organization as a machine, and then explaining it to organism is like less than 5%. And so it's like, oh, you've got that problem. Then it's like, how do you get contextualism when describing it that way? It's like, that's so far from where people are. But in terms of world theory, trying to get out of my, my, my criticism, actually, of most of the system thinking literature is that it's almost all organicism. And it's like, OK, then if you come at it from contextualism, let's forget all the stuff I'm doing in Chinese philosophy. Just stay within Pepper. Is, is there a well understood, is there a sufficient understanding of contextualism? And I would say no. Uh, there's a lot of confusion around contextualism. And so that would be less than 1% of the people who are going to be discussing anything contextual. Can I ask a more question? Go ahead. Um, you know, question. Go ahead. Um, so, so to, to an extent, I can come at this much more as an observer than an participant. Okay. Uh, Interesting, not surprising. So, um, so if we look at the world and the business perspective and whatever, there's a clear need for uh, a systemic approach to be taken to solve some of the challenges that we face. Um, and so, so, I spent four years with IBM. Yeah. It's probably bigger than you see. So, so, a few people before. So, for people who don't know, at that time, IBM had five R&D labs mm -hmm. in the world. We sat in business consulting tools and talking to our clients and we had an interesting issue. We might go to one of the labs. We didn't go to the software engineers or any of the people who knew the detail. We went to the team in front of the translators. Effectively, we went and said, my translator, this and they went, oh yes, that means X are going to talk to them in their language. So, so where are the, the systems translators who, you know, organizations and business can go to and say, I have this system issue. How do I address it? And rather than, you know, they can then turn around and say, actually, package of things that you need, the approach you need is this, I'll help you do it. Where do those people sit? Because, you know, you've, you've sort of got a the system thinking world mm -hmm. and all the interesting debates. Yeah. That doesn't translate easily externally. Yeah. So, so I'm looking for hope that says, yes, there are those people and we will solve the system problems in the world. Okay, so those are what we call tribal learners. And so the tribal learners are able to go to different environments mm -hmm. and actually work in all those different environments. They have to be able to experience and, um, the cultures in the way that they actually exist. So in the case of my sons, it's like, oh, I can drop them into China. Like, I can drop them into any country now. It's like, oh, okay, I've, I've dealt with not having a, the internet. You know, I've dealt without having you know, money. I've dealt with all these different things. And they can adapt to that. But we don't necessarily want that many people in those roles because they're actually going to be disruptive. Um, so, so I say. It's a, well, so <laughs> as I say, so for, pro, we want a lot of proto learners because I want my garbage picked up on a regular schedule. I don't want innovation and creativity on my garbage pickup. So, so there, there's a place for proto learners, a place for neutral learners, and there's a place for trio learners. But um, the training for trial learners is actually fairly difficult. We're wrestling with the best way to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, the, the program I was most involved with, at Alta University in 2010 and 2011, uh, there was a program called Creative Sustainability Program. Um, and as a requirement, they had uh, two system thinking courses at the beginning. And so I wrote them. And I taught system thinking in Finland. Uh, in, then I had to go back to IBM. And have my friends pick it up. And the first thing they have to do is remake all the courses because uh, going into system thinking as course one and two 
it was like course four and five. They'd be a sequence of the whole thing. And so first it was to get people into the mindset uh, of, of making that change. Because the people coming into the program were from engineering, business, architecture, social science. They're all across. They don't have any language to communicate with each other. And so after they got to the system thinking course, they go, oh, of course, it's obvious. Why did you make this in the first course? And yeah, we tried that. You're not going to get it. But at that point, they turned into trial learners. And I, I, having taught them, I understood. I said, I comfortably take you to an a ISSS a system science conference, and you'll be OK. Uh, but I couldn't have said that about that at the beginning of the course. But that, that idea of transitioning and translating mm -hmm. is, is a tough one. Um, not everyone's going to make it. No, but yeah, so, so for example, just trying to be so practical. So um, here we've talked about the devolution agenda that's going to go down the line for East Yorkshire and the whole uh, mayoral team, all of those types of things. Uh, and you do that one, then there will have to be some interesting systemic issues. Who does the, um, where does the, the new mayor of the region turn to? to find the translators to help them with these systemic issues. Because I came out of KKG and we were seeing that again. I never saw them to be at all. Which, which organization is providing these people to translate between the two very different worlds? Yeah. Because if, if the answer is nobody, then as a systems thinking community, you're failing mm -hmm. because you're not providing them. Yeah. And therefore, you are just a, a really interesting set of people talking to yourselves, rather than going out into the world and helping to solve systemic issues. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, and and so part of it is making is making the changes, um, and so the, the stuff you've heard today is trying to make the difference on the approach, because people could say that what I'm doing now is not systemic. If I say that I'm focused on when and where, like really, it's like I, I can have that happen. I've, I've taught this before, and people said, "This is not like the system thinking I've had before." And I go, "Yeah, it's not." But in in what's happened is a lot of the questions that have come up about change. You know, so so is it actually about systems change, like system thinking? Let us let, let me stay within my ballpark. Are people really interested in system change, or are they just interested in well, now I think that's the question. You know, um, if I come out, come out of the world of doing transformation programs. Yeah. Um, so a lot of this is really interesting to me and highlights some of the differences in the approaches that you take. So I take it as a systems change piece. But I just have this fear that the world will burn down and you'll still be talking to each other, but to nobody else. So, so how are you going to fill the gap? How do you make it from the classroom to the real world? I'm not in the classroom right now. Or I have, I have this moment, but I'm yeah. not part of a I'm not part of a university program. So we have, we're trying to do it in the CSRP Institute, but it's small and starting up. So yeah. so it's a gap. There's a gap. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and I was talking to Amanda about the uh, the uh, system size community, which I think is actually a weak point. On board, so um, I think I think things will get stronger. But we knew there was going to be a downturn. They're going to go through a cycle. So you know, I think that we're actually at a low point right now. We think that I think the challenge is you're always alone in recognition for the skills is increasing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that the the bigger issue I actually have is. Uh, it's all the people that say that they're doing systems thinking to the point where it's not helpful. Like it's like, okay, are you really systems thinking? Like do you actually know the history, do you know why you would use this approach as opposed to that approach, or you just have a tool to say this is the the, uh, the hammer to every nail. Yeah, I, 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 I just I get the impression that it's you know, it needs to be a significant effort in the universities and whoever to Stop producing the translators now because they're leaving now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. You haven't given me hope. 
Where's the where? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me wind down. Uh, okay. So um, thank you for hanging me, hanging with me for so long. Um, so I'm just going to wind up and um, and tell you about um, where we're at with this. And so. I wanted to go back to the beginning of this. So in 2013, this was the paper that was published in SRBS, uh, Rethinking Systems Thinking. Uh, and then in, um, uh, in 2022 was when we first did our workshop. And so um, on the System Changes site and on the CodeEvolving.com site is this one, which is the, uh, the workshop that we did for Code for Canada. That was the first time we've actually done this work. And a lot of the ideas that you've heard today are there. The workbook is there. We write everything in Creative Commons. And so um, people can use this, adopt it, change it. We're still working on that. Um, we have uh, this paper, which was published in the Journal of Systemic Cybernetics and Informatics. Um, System Changes, Recasting, Refine, Superintimic Shift, Long Doing, Making, Thinking. Um, and so that is the, probably the core of what you've heard today. And so if you actually are interested in actually following through, this is the paper that kind of explains all the stuff that goes behind it. So with propensity, Chinese medicine, all stuff is there. Um, this is a paper that got published in SRBS last year. This is actually um, more of a historical paper about how we got to this, uh, because there are uh, threads that go through the pattern language, there are threads that go through um, ecological anthropology and also the references to Keacock Lee and the Chinese medicine, how that ties in. Um, this paper uh, is in the journal of the ISSS. It was published at the beginning of 2023. Um, and this one is a, um, a history of the pragmatism uh, from uh, James through to, uh, uh, to Acoff and the churchmen and all those people. And then the question is do how we take it from that and translate it into the rhythmic stuff that we've done and try not to do, <coughs> do too much damage to, um, um, to what, what we had with uh, a system thinking in the 1980s. <coughs> this paper is yet unpublished. Um, and so uh, if you want a copy, you can email me and let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll email you this one. <coughs> this one was on in the International Journal of Systems, uh, uh, sorry, International Journal of Organizational Theory and Behavior. Uh, they did a call for papers, and um, apparently we were the only conceptual paper. And so the editor is holding it up because he wants it to be the lead paper. And, and uh, but he hasn't given me any rewrites yet, so I'm wondering what's going on with that paper. Um, going forward, um, the group that I'm working with is a Creative uh, Systemic Research Platform Institute. It's incorporated in. Um, in Switzerland, uh, run by uh, Susu Nosala, uh, who is um, between Finland and Barcelona, and she's an Australian actually. Um, but um, uh, we're, we are starting this year, we have a conversation, a vanity conversation coming up in uh, September, and the call was supposed to be done now, but it still is not yet out, so it should be done this week. Um, so that concludes the formal talk for today. Um, thank you very much for your patience. Thanks for having me here at all. Uh, you know where to find me. I blog a lot, coevolving.com, and eventually you might see uh, these slides and the audio redone for people that uh, didn't catch it the first time. Thanks. David, in the usual way, um, it truly met the description, I think, of an expert-led event. Um, light in my mind is completely blown <laughs> from what you've presented today. You've pulled us in so many different directions and given us so much to think about. So thank you so much for that. And thank you all for participating, including the people who've been participating online. I know it's, it's a bit tricky when you're online, so thank you for staying with us. And uh, 